Hello again and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd, I'll be your host for the next hour of Good Gardening. We'll be answering your emails tonight. If you'd like to send us a question or a picture, you can email us at byf at unl.edu. Make sure you tell us as much as you can about your question. Please remember to tell us where you live. And as a reminder, we're getting hundreds of questions e each week. It's really impossible for us to answer everybody's question on the air, but you can explore our Backyard Farmer YouTube channel to see if that question has been answered in the past. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week on those other social media pa pages, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. As always, we start with samples. Jody, you always have something in a little box. Yes. I do. I try to package them all nicely because most people don't want to see these, but I brought cicada killer wasps. So uh, I've got the female here on the right and you can see it's a rather large wasp. So some of them will get to two inches long. So it can be quite intimidating. And then the one here, this is uh, the male and the male is a little bit smaller, but we are getting a lot of calls right now. People saying hornets. So these are not hornets, but they're wasps. Uh, they are our largest wasps that we have here, and they are ground nesters. So you may see them digging in the landscape. They create big piles and they kind of have a U-shaped entrance hole where the female will go in and out. And sometimes you'll get to see her carrying a cicada. So that's what they're preying on. The males, those littler ones, still big, will be kind of flying around in your, your face. They seem very scary, but they do not have a stinger. and. Neither of these are aggressive. If you have these and you want to get rid of them in your landscape, I would either call a professional or you could treat each individual nest. But again, they're not aggressive. The only time they will sting, because the female does have a stinger, is if you step on them with bare feet, you handle them, or, or like slap them with your, your bare hands. So I would just say leave them alone if you can. All right, excellent. Okay, you match your shirt with whatever your sample is. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so we're getting onto that time where it's you know time to plant or renovate a lawn, and actually next week there is going to be the uh, digging deeper that mm -hmm. Kim and I will participate in about renovating a lawn and why you do what and how you choose things. But uh, just to get a jump on that, make your seed choices and whatever species you're going to plant. I wanted to show a seed label because this is the probably the most important thing you can do when buying. Um, seed is by make sure you buy blue tag certified seed. It may seem like, well, you know, that's a little bit more expensive, but you know, figure it out. And do you want to fight the weeds now or later? Do you want to have a variety that you're not sure than the bag? And this blue tag certified seed that's issued by the, um, you know, the Crop Improvement Association of Nebraska and in every state will tell you where the seed came from, what the variety is, what the species is, how well it germinates, and whether or not there's any noxious or um, problematic weeds in it, and uh, what else is in the bag besides that so this is this is a critical thing to do the white the blue tag is what you want to do you can get every seed bag by law or seed box in the garden stores or wherever has to have a tag on it for the seed for turf seed um, this would be the white tag and I'm not saying this is the guaranteed don't buy but all the white tag tells you is that it's got something in it and it may or may not be technically accurate um, and so you really don't want to take the risk of planting something that you're not sure of. And often the white tag will say, rather than a variety, it'll say variety not stated, what we call VNS. And then it could be floor sweepings, literally <laughs> put in a box and sold to you. So let's avoid that like, uh, I was gonna say like the plague, but that's inappropriate right now. But let's, let's <laughs> avoid that at all cost. Let's buy blue tag certified seed and uh, many of your garden stores, as well as your seed dealers in and around Nebraska will sell you certified blue tag turf grass seed to make your life better. Excellent. All right, Kyle, not better on that privet. No, so yeah, I just have some, some sad looking privet here today. Um, and we have, we have some leaf spots that are showing up on it, but really I brought the sample to talk about the lifespan of plants. And plants do have a lifespan. We all know this for, the, for our annuals, so geraniums, petunias, we expect them to die at the end of the year, but for some reason when something is woody, people seem to think that they will survive forever. Um, and so uh, plants don't do that, unfortunately. Some do, well, most don't. Um, but this is privet. This is about privet that's about 30, 35 years old and is just uh, do, having a kind of general decline. We're having a lot of leaf spots that are showing up, 
a lot of tip dieback, things like that that are occurring. If we look at some of the branches, you know, we are seeing um, some black coloration that's an indication of, 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 of some sort of fungal pathogen that's come in and colonized the dead tissue. We also have a lot of lichen that is starting to grow on, grow on this privet as well, another indication that it's not necessarily the, the healthiest plant. And so really as far as what, what to do, um, really just keep in mind the lifespan of your plants when you, when you buy them originally. Or if you are wondering why, you're, um, why something that's 40, 50 years old isn't doing so hot, maybe do a little bit of research and see maybe this plant's only supposed to live for 45 years. And so we would expect it to decline towards the end of its life. Um, and that's really the, that's really the, the, the main reason why I, why I have this, this sick looking privet is plants do have a, a, a lifespan and we can't forget that when we, when we are thinking about management decisions. Can't, can't treat them into uh, living forever. Exactly, exactly. All right, thanks Kyle. All right, you have four questions for your first round, Jody. Okay. The first one is a Bennington viewer had uh, both zucchini plants did not fare well. They'd grow vegetables, then die right away. Examining, they found this. Uh, they think it's growing near the root. What is this? Okay, so this is the frass from the squash vine borer moth. And unfortunately, these plants are not gonna make it. And it does seem overnight that it goes from looking good and producing fruit to wilting and dying. So it's a moth that lays an egg like on the stem. The caterpillars emerge. They bore right into the stem and this frass is what they kick out. Um, this will happen to zucchini and other like gourds and uh, melons, so. All right, your second one is an Elkhorn viewer. Last year, first year they gardened, pumpkin, squash, and watermelons all deteriorated from the root out. Okay, and this could be the same thing mm -hmm. if that's, um, that, that's the frass. So it's like yellow and foamy. If, if you catch it really early, like if you see the eggs, that's when you can treat um, so that when the caterpillar emerges, you'll kill the caterpillar on contact. But once it gets this far, it's pretty much a goner. I mean, you can do surgery on it. It hasn't worked in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think some people will bury the rest of the stem and see if it'll Yeah, I mean, if, if you yeah. can get one out like early, like you have to do surgery on, on the root and then pile it up and it may grow back, but sometimes there are like three or four in there and right. you can't keep up with it. All right, your next one is these insects showed up on the zucchini plants this week and this is near Wahoo. Yes, these are squash bugs. They are very bad right now and it looks like there's probably a couple egg clusters that hatch because they look different stage nymphs. Uh, the best thing to do now is get a big bucket of soapy water and try to like tap all of those in there and then scout every day for new eggs. So they're gonna be clusters of red eggs on, on the leaf, under the leaf, on the stem and just squish them, take those leaves off. It is really hard to keep up with them and it's really hard to treat with insecticide when they've already hatched into these nymph stages and they're, the adults are mating, laying eggs all the time. All so right. scout and squish. So much for the zucchini on that one. And finally, this is a tropical hibiscus. He's, he's wondering if they're Mexican bean beetles. <laughs> they are not Mexican <laughs> bean beetles, but they are um, multi, multicolored Asian lady beetle pupae. So if you put them somewhere, they'll, they'll um, come out lady beetles. But what I would think about is look, looking under the leaves here for aphids or any uh, sap suckers because usually the beetles, their natural enemies, they're gonna look for uh, places to, to, to eat bugs. So there may be bugs there, so a good indicator. Excellent, thanks Jody. All right, Rock, you also have four in your first round. Uh, the first one here is, um, this is Lincoln, lawn yellows and thins. It's happened for the past two to three years. The grass has very shallow roots and peels out and he thinks they have a small cricket-like insect. Yeah, this looks like uh, billbug to me and I'm assuming the lawn is bluegrass, but uh, at the same time, uh, billbugs affect tall fescue and perennial ryegrass as well. But I'm gonna guess that this is a bluegrass billbug. It really doesn't matter because their growth cycle coincides. It w so it doesn't really matter what what species it particular it is at this time. Um, what's interesting about this is if you see the little critter that looks cricket-like, it's got a big, um, Jody, correct me, a proboscis 
It's got it's got a snout. Weevils have a snout. That's a snout, right? And yeah. and that's you know that's how they get bill. Like, like they got a bill. <laughs> they don't quack like a duck, so it's not a duck. But they they, they have a bill on them, um, and so we're the bill bugs. And you know right now they're really protected in the sheath of the plant. And if you pull up on it, like they indicated, and and the roots seem to be what you're going to see is a hollow stem. You know grasses usually have stuff in them, a hollow stem, and then a lot of the frass that Jody was talking about earlier. It's not you should have treated them. You know in in June. And there are products labeled for uh, um, the bill bugs, or you can plant resistant varieties and consider if that lawn's older, you might want to renovate with a resistant variety because there are, you know, there are uh, grasses that are um, tolerant of uh, bill bug. All right, your second one is also uh, Lincoln. This is buffalo grass. Dead spots in only one section. He's thinking this was grubs. Uh, grubs don't really affect uh, buffalo grass because it's got such an extensive root system. They do feed on them, however, and grubs will also feed on tall fescue, but we don't see the damage because the root um, system is so extensive. So I, I, this looks like chinch bug to me, which is a surface feeder. Um, you know, it's really easy to detect because you simply put a, um, you know, you can pull a plug and shake it over a piece of paper and you'll see those little critters um, fall out and run all over the place. They, they scurry about. And um, so really you've, you've, you've missed the, uh, the treatment window. Um, and then if you start treating them later in the season, you know, they move around. So you really want to get the, hit these, you can hit them now because they're going to be, there's going to be adults that are present, especially if you detect adults, um, with a bifenthrin or a carbaryl type product, seven, um, for example. And since they are not very systemic products, you really have to knock them down. So you, you have to get them on them and make sure that they're present there. But you can generally control them with the readily available carbaryl or bifenthrin. All right, your next one, uh, she sent us pictures in May and then she sent them uh, again and it looks good but two different colors of grass early and then she does a pre-emerge, she does something for Japanese beetles and she says she spent a ton of money and it looks like this. Yeah, I actually think this is a physical problem. I mean, if you look, there seems to be a path you know, they've walked and then I think there's a gate down at the end of this picture if the viewers can see that. I think this is actually an area that's been compacted. Compacted soil warms up quicker in the, in the spring, so the grass tends to green up more and it tends to look a different color, almost almost a different species. Um, so I would consider, you know, if you, if you can't get a screwdriver, a Phillips screwdriver down into that ground when it's slightly moist and then you walk over where the grass is actually doing better and plug it in and it goes readily in, then that's compaction and then consider plugging um, those areas really aggressive this fall and, you know, sometime in late August, early September and maybe do some overseeding. All right, and your final one I may flip a little bit to Kyle, but this is Omaha in the spring, looks great. Come summer, other things happen. He does four step and he thinks this is frog eye. Yeah, I don't think that's frog eye. It doesn't have the typical pattern that I see in frog eye. No, I, I kind of, I don't, doesn't, doesn't look like frog eye to me either. Actually what it looks like to me is rough bluegrass which goes south in the summer and it's a contaminant in seed or birds can move it. Um, you know, when they get a little sprig that's got some seed in it or they'll actually um, excrete it. So I'm thinking that you got a little poa triv plant there um, that basically got planted and then in the middle of the summer, especially if it's in partial to full sun, uh, that rough bluegrass or the poa trivialis is its uh, scientific name, goes south and it looks really, really bad and then it comes out the next spring. It's a little lighter green in color. So my guess based on this picture is it's definitely not frog eye and is probably uh, rough bluegrass. All right. Okay, Kyle, you only have, you have four pictures, but only three questions. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> the first one here, this is uh, between Geneva and Shickley, and it's beans, and the first two pictures are, this is her second crop. First one died from something different. These don't show signs of insects, they just do this. They curl up, they get dry, and they crumble. So I think your second picture also shows what's yeah. going on with them. Um, kind of difficult to to determine what the exact disease going on here is um, you know with with our with our garden beans we have a lot of bacterial issues that can that can cause 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 problems and I kind of think that we may be dealing with halo blight here um, typically halo blight will affect much larger portions of the of the bean leaf um, as opposed to some of our other diseases that are um, kind of smaller lesions Kind of get that nice blighted area that that will turn papery and fall out um, as they as as the lesions mature, and so I that's my guess for what's going on. 
Unfortunately, you know, with our bacterial diseases, not a lot of great control methods that we have. So sanitation is going to be very important. Most of these diseases are, um, they do survive in the soil. So making sure that we are cleaning up the garden at the end of the year and, crop, and rotating that crop as best we can or will be the best things you can do for uh, the, these bacterial diseases. All right, and your next picture is also beans. This is from Torrington, Wyoming. Every year she plants them, they get a fungus or a blight that starts at the bottom. Uh, she has rotated, she's used copper, but to no avail. What are we thinking here? Um, yeah, and this, I. To me, this almost looks like uh, looks like a cercospora um, that's that's kind of for causing that that bronzing that's that's occurring. Um, if it is a cercospora, it, it occurs in soybeans as well, um, and it's one that is very difficult to control with with any sort of fungicides. So that's maybe why you're having the difficulty there. Um, you know, I would look for look for um, try a resistant variety, if, anything that is labeled disease resistance or, or fungal resistant, that would be my best bet. All right, and your final one is uh, Oto County. Hasn't seen this issue in the past, found it on both their jalapeno and their bell peppers. So this to me looks like bacterial speck um, or bacterial spot. They um, will kind of form these, these scabby lesions on the fruit. Um, can form lesions on really all parts of the plant, but the, these fruit lesions are what we're, what, we're, what we're most concerned about. Nice thing is, is that bacterial spot does not impact the fruit at all. So this is more than fine to eat. Um, so you'll have to, have to get over those little kind of rough spots, but they'll still fry up and, and, um, and eat just fine. As far as control, again, bacterial diseases, we don't have a lot of options aside from rotation and looking for resistant varieties. But if it is a perennial problem um, in your peppers, you may want to start thinking about a fixed copper op application about every 10 to 14 days when we have warm, humid weather. If it's going to be hot and dry for a little while, we can, knock, um, can hold off on those sprays. But when we do have those warm, humid conditions, then you'll want to get back to that, that um, spray schedule. We don't have any of that here. No, none. No. none. All right. Well, succulents are a versatile ornamental that can be grown indoors in some of your drier areas or in a pot on the patio or indoors. We recently took our camera to Bluebird Nursery in Clarkson to check out the wide variety of succulents. One of the biggest sellers for this succulent area is just getting a succulent mix. So basically we get to pick out which, which ones you're gonna get when you place your order, but we make sure that it's a variety of styles and colors and shapes and sizes. And, um, and what's exciting is you just never know what you're gonna get. It might be something that we don't even have in the catalog, but we're gonna sneak one in so you can get a sneak preview of it. Um, that's what's exciting because even though there's like, oh, I don't know, 128 varieties, you know, we're always producing to get more in the catalog. Our, I think our goal is to try to get like five new varieties in the catalog every year. So we've got a lot of them out here in our greenhouse that, you know, would be a sneak preview because we're working on them to get enough production to, to get in the catalog basically. But we have some sneak previews back here, um, things that you couldn't order, but you might get a few of them in your mix variety when you order them. And actually those are the top seller. I, I don't know how many thousands of those that we sold this year. And everybody wants succulents. They're using them for wedding decorations. Um, there's a lot of little garden stores that are using them to have classes and make little succulent dishes and containers. I've, I've seen magazines, people are using them in wedding bouquets. Um, so that's kind of just been the last how many years, I would guess, but um, they're just still a hot item. So, and it's fun because there's just so many colors and varieties to pick from. So, um, biggest thing is everybody tends to overwater them because it's not a regular plant. We, even in the greenhouse where it's hot and sunny and could be 110 degrees in here on a daily basis, we still only water the succulents maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. Um, so just that, Overwatering is what kills them every time. It's not a regular plant. These are you know, like tropical desert plants and they're used to not having any water. And you know, when they get that water, they suck it down to the bottom and it's good to go for a long time, so. 
As you can clearly see, there's so much variety in colors and textures, and a lot of them are really just plain weird. And if you take care of them correctly, they'll give you all that beauty for years to come inside and out. All right, Jody, three of them this time. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Valentine. This is a cottonwood, unfolded this leaf that is folded up, found webbing and some eggs. He wonders how they, how the, uh, he thinks they're aphids and how did they fold the leaf? Oh, okay, well, if they saw webbing, it might be um, a leaf roller, but if you know there's aphids, so when they suck the plant sap, it just makes the leaf curl because it sucks the sap out of it. Mm -hmm. And not much you can do. There's not much you can do. All right, your next one is North Platte. Uh, what are these? Okay, this is kind of cool and creepy at the same time. These are walnut caterpillars. Mm -hmm. They feed in these big masses, but they come down the trunk to molt, and so you'll have all this like hairy, molted larvae. <laughs> it's gross, it sounds gross, yeah, it's gross. Okay, so that that's what happens, they go back up and they feed. All right. That's what that is, just <laughs> knock it off into soapy water. <laughs> and your third one, uh, this is an ash, and uh, this emerged, and she thinks okay. this is emerald ash borer. This is not emerald ash borer. This is the pupil case of a carpenter worm. So it turned into a moth, and usually that happens with ash trees that are stressed. So I would call an arborist if you're worried about that tree, because it is an ash. All right, excellent. Rock, your first one here is Omaha, beautiful lawn being taken over by weeds, used pre-emerge, and then a weed and feed, they still appear. What do we have here? Uh, that's crabgrass, and there's a little bit of oxalis in that picture as well, but that's crabgrass. It's, it, it's at a point now where it could be treated with like a quincolac product, and that will also knock out the oxalis. So you want to get on it now because once it starts to seed, you can actually accelerate seed production and you'll just have more next year. But they put down a pre. It doesn't look like they put down a second application. So normally two applications of the pre is required to get season-long control. All right, uh, your next one is Battle Creek. They hydra seeded on June 6th, and this is what they've got instead. And you've got two pictures on this one. Yeah. Yeah, so they've also got crabgrass. And once again, they could treat with the quinclorac product. Um, it, it looked like there was a lot of crabgrass in there. Um, you know, that's grass is, you know, it needs some fertilizer as well, but it was just seeded. So give it some time to recover and, 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 and be patient because it looks like it needs a little more fertilizer and spraying it as young as it is with a, even with the drive product could be problematic. So wait till fall, first frost this crabgrass is gonna die and then make sure you get a pre-emergent on it, but get some fertilizer on it so you can start mowing it. All right, and your third one is Columbus. What is this? Uh, it's crabgrass. <laughs> <laughs> and so the same thing? Yeah, the same thing. It's, this isn't a special crabgrass that gets special treatment. That's crabgrass. <laughs> and your final one here is Lincoln, and he calls this a limp sort of a strange grass coming up in uh, in the bluegrass fescue lawn. And, and I, I, this, uh, Mr. Blockcamp, who sent this, mm -hmm. he sent a bunch of pictures, and mm -hmm. I mean, all the vegetative structures were there. This is orchard grass, and it surprised me that it said it was limp, but this is orchard grass, which is a forage grass uh, normally, but birds do move the seed um, and the wind can blow the seed as well so uh, it's going to have to be it's a bunch grass it can get really clumpy uh, if you're using a mower you're going to bounce all over um, it so you need to spot spray with glyphosate and hope the bluegrass or the fescue which he's got a little bit of both in that picture um, hope it fills in if not throw a little bit of seed out this fall excellent all right uh, you say tomato I say tomato you've got three of them I say they're <laughs> all gross <laughs> this is uh, your first one's Roca and uh, can what is happening here on this they've sprayed for fungus and bugs so I, I think this is another bacterial issue that that we have here um, and this that to me this this looks like bacterial spot as well and so it hits both tomatoes and peppers Again, not, not a whole lot that you can do as far as control. Um, if you are, um, unless you're thinking about a fixed um, copper fungicide or a fixed copper application every every 10 to 14 days, every 10 to 14 days to control the bacteria. All right. Uh, your next one is Ceresco, and she says the leaves are curling and turning brown. About a week ago, this is mulched with wood mulch. They do have consistent moisture. So. Um, I, could be could be a few things, you know. Any time we have this kind of marginal burning, often we'll be thinking about um, thinking about moisture, not be, uh, not um, moisture stress. But as I zoomed in on some of those lesions, it did look like there were um, some some of those concentric rings that we often get with early blight. So that's kind of what I'm wondering about here. 
Um, remove those lower leaves as best you can, and then do um, avoid that overhead watering as well, and that should help slow the slow the disease down. All right, and your final uh, one is from Norfolk, and leaf curl on all 14 of his tomato plants. They're all from seed. The new growth looks normal. Um, he's wondering, is it virus, whether he uses daconil um, on a schedule? So if it's, if it's hitting every, hitting all 14 peppers, tend to think that there's something environmental going on, um, potentially some sort of herbicide issue, something like that. If you were seeing it start off on maybe one or one end of the one end of the tomato plants, and then it moves across to the other 14, well, maybe that would be more something about um, some virus issue. But since it's hitting all of them about the same, I would really be wondering about um, something environmental, whether that, that that is herbicide or just lack of moisture. All right. And Ky sorry, Kyle. So, what would tobacco leaf mosaic look like? Um, well, we typically we would, we'd see a, some mosaics on the leaves, okay. um, and so there, instead of there would be that that curling, but also some some lighter yellow color, some lighter yellow portions on the leaf that would indicate the uh, the viruses. Yeah, the reason I ask is that in New Mexico they grow you know they're the chili capital of the world mm -hmm. and they grow a lot of green chili and everything and uh, pickers are are they they won't hire them if they smoke okay. because you can transmit the virus. I think it's right. uh, yep, yeah, they, they it's yeah. a virus, and, and so that looks a lot like when I was, you know, doing chili fills. That looks like without the mosaic, right? It, mm -hmm. That curling. So I, I just, if anyone in the family smokes, quit. It, yep, <laughs> no, and, and tobacco mosaic virus. That's one of those that has a very wide host range. It right. can hit a whole number of plants. All right, Kyle, you actually have one more. This is in okay. Ruby's German green tomato, seven feet tall flowers and then leaves near the bottom, it's starting to do this. So I think here we have fusarium wilt. Um, so fusarium wilt often will um, be on one side, of the, one side of the plant. If you look at the back of that tomato plant, it does look to me like the, the leaves are more or less healthy. Not really nothing to do um, as far as control aside from removing the plant. If it has set fruit, you know, the fruit will continue to ripen, but they're not the fruit won't be as big and it won't set near as many. Um, next year, just make sure you're not planting tomatoes in that same area as it is a soil-borne um, soil pathogen. So I want, really wanna be make, making sure to rotate for All that right. one. Thanks, Kyle. Well, it has been hot. We've had a lot of moisture and that's been very good for our garden. Tonight, Terry James is going to feature a new cucumber. So let's see what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to continue looking at our new All-America Selection winners. We're going to look at a cucumber this week. The cucumber is called Cucumber Green Light. Um, it's actually looking really well. We have it growing in one of our raised beds, that's, um, and we're using the trellis for it. However, it seems to think that it doesn't want to climb up. It wants to climb down, but it still looks great in our raised bed. This is a national winner. Um, the Judges say that it picks really easy, looks great, tastes great. So these cucumbers, they're gonna be a vine, so you are gonna probably need to have it grow up something. They're gonna have a um, pretty good size, about three and a half inches when it's fully ripe. Um, they're gonna be about two and a half inches long, so great for slicing, for putting into your salads. And um, a pretty short um, days to harvest if you're, um, going out for sowing straight into the soil about 37 to 42 so this one would be really good even if you wanted to start it right now if you can find the seed so stop by the backyard farmer garden and check out our new cucumber green light growing in our garden you right now it is time for lightning you ready kyle always all right, this is an ord viewer um, that has used a fungicide every two weeks on his garden and it has improved. Should he continue till frost and next year? Um, no, it's unless you know what you're spraying for, it's really not a good idea to be on a scheduled, um, scheduled pesticide application. Integrated pest management, always know what you're, what you're trying to control for. Don't just spray willy nilly. 
All right, and uh, also from Ord, do lawns become resistant to a fungicide or should you change the fungicide? Uh, there are certain um, certain fungi and um, turf, fun, fun, there are certain turf pathogens that can become resistant to the fungicide. It's not terribly common though, no. All right, uh, on an earlier show, we said not to use baking soda for early blight, why not? Um, because we don't have good research showing that it works all the time. All right. Uh, will powdered milk at the base of the roots of a tomato plant kill early blight? Um, I highly doubt it. I don't know of any fungicide um, activity in, in powdered milk, so I, I don't think it would control early blight. No. <laughs> you didn't laugh at that one. I did when I, I read it. <laughs> all right. Uh, Rock, are you ready? Sure. Okay, so <laughs> we have a viewer who uh, wonders whether using a herbicide in the fall for weed control that has quinclorac in it is the right thing to do. Yeah, that's primarily a gr grass herbicide for like crabgrass and that sort of stuff, and in the fall, crabgrass is gonna die anyway, but it does work on some broadleaf uh, weeds as well. Check the label, make sure the weeds you're going after are on the label. All right, this is a West Point uh, viewer who wonders whether high temperatures or other temperature swings will impact grass when it's mowed. Um, actually, when you're mowing, you know, the temperature, unless it's wilted and drought stressed, it's more about whether it's drought stressed or not rather than the temperature. All right, this is a Sioux City viewer who wonders whether weeds should be sprayed in the heat and he's using tenacity and sedgehammer. Yeah, you wanna avoid primarily to, due to non-target injury, any spray herbicide application when temperatures are above 85 degrees. All right, this is a papillion viewer who has tons of tree seedlings this year. Mow them or treat otherwise? Mow them. Okay, this is an Omaha viewer who wonders how to get rid of goosegrass. Yeah, goosegrass is really difficult. Clincorac barely burns it back a little bit. Um, a pre-emergent in the spring, but do it later rather than you know mid mid um, early May. Uh, go all the way to the end of May. All right, excellent, nice job. All right, Jody. This is this is an Ord viewer. Also, uh, their lawn is totally bumpy and filled with night crawlers, and he's wondering whether uh, he should do something like raise or lower the soil pH, and will that get rid of the night crawlers? I don't know. <laughs> you can pass. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a Blair viewer who wonders about uh, treating for Zimmerman pine moth now in their trees. Zimmerman pine moth. Um, it's usually when the are, are they seeing like the pitch mass? They're seeing the pitch mass. Pass. I'll pass on that right now too. <laughs> this is a Waterloo viewer who wants to know whether a water, salt, and vinegar spray is useful to get rid of wasps. No. A Newell, Iowa viewer has 20% of their sweet corn has a caterpillar in the tip of each ear. Corn earworm? And how do they avoid that next year? There's going to be a couple in every ear of corn that you, that you get or grow. All right. Uh, should you control the aphids on milkweed or not? Um, it depends. Uh, I, I leave a couple, but I hose off a couple every couple weeks. I mean, there's a lot, but... But no. I mean, if you're gonna get a lot, yeah. If you're gonna get uh, city mold, then you can hose them off, but I don't know. Moderate amount of aphids is okay. It's not for everybody. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, our plants of the week are this great big giant beautiful one is Joe Pie Weed which is in our backyard farmer garden, just fabulous right now, just beginning to open. This is in the Aster family. Uh, there are some that will be shorter, Little Joe and Baby Joe, and some that are five or six feet tall. It likes partial shade to full sun and kind of a wet condition. And uh, the one that is sort of weeping and around the edges here, the darker purple, is one of the butterfly bushes, also in our backyard farmer garden, extremely fragrant. People who have butterfly bushes know they come in all sorts of sizes and colors, and there are lots of smaller dwarf ones on the market now. This is probably one of the older uh, orange eyes that was originally a dark knight or somebody like that. So, beautiful stuff out of our backyard farmer garden. All right, here we go. Jody, you have uh, four this time. The first is from Omaha. 
What is and what is this amazing caterpillar? Oh well, I'm glad you think it's amazing because it's supposed to look like bird droppings, but it <laughs> turns into a beautiful butterfly that I've never even seen in real life. It's called a red spotted purple, but it's like a blue butterfly, like your shirt. It's beautiful. beautiful. All right, so this is a Wahoo, Nebraska, who says what's attacking their tomatoes. What do you think is in here? It's a tomato fruit worm. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> Can you keep them from attacking? Um, a, lot of, a lot of times it's just like scouting the tomato because you don't want to pick it, but they, they bore in right where the stem is and they'll go right into the fruit and leave droppings and things like that. Yuck. So just kind of keeping an eye on the, on the fruits. Just All right. Your, garden. your third one here is a Lincoln viewer. First red tomatoes and some green ones have fallen victim to little black bugs. Okay, they probably first got tomato tomato fruit worm, which is the same as uh, the, the corn earworm, so that's why it's, it's interesting. They're both there. But those little black bugs are sap beetles, and so they feed on like fermenting, overripe, decaying fruit. So when you see this happening, you want to pick those and you know, get those out of the garden because sap beetles will fly in and they will get all the rotten fruit. All right, and your final one is an interesting insect slash hornworm of some sort. Okay, so it would help to know what kind of tree that is. Uh, so if it, it, it's usually associated with that tree, but it's a type of sphinx moth. So it could be uh, an elm sphinx moth. Is that an elm? Mm -hmm. I think it's so. It's an elm sphinx moth. There or it'll go. grow up to be that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, Rock, your turn. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an Elmwood viewer, uh, has seen this before in a remote wet location. What is this and how do you control it? Uh, this is daughter, which is an interesting parasitic plant that has no root system. So it has enough seed reserve so that it germinates and then it finds the plant and it attaches itself to the plant and rolls up the plant and then eventually could kill it if it gets you know bad enough. Um, there really isn't in, in this situation, there really isn't much you can do. You can try to hand pull it off before it gets to this extent. It's gonna get a bunch of little white flowers on it. Every one of those white flowers is going to produce a one to five seeds. So a pre-emergent in the, in the fall, like preen um, or even you know a Scott's Halt type product, a pendimethalin based product, does a pretty good job pre-emergent. But at this point in time, try to pull as much of it you can off of it because it, it can't make, um, you know, they come yellow, red, and, and but not green. They can't make its own food. So it steals the food from the host plant. Um, I, I find these really intriguing and... Creepy. They're not creepy, they're just, creepy. they don't even have a root system. They're I think fascinating. That's, they're, they're fascinating, creepy. thank you. I, <laughs> I think Kiskuka is the genus and there's over 205 different species. Yeah. All right, the, your next one is Scott's Bluff. Um, she says it's very invasive. Her husband calls it a spurge and she wants to know how to get rid of it. Yeah, this is spurge. You could also control this pre-emergent in the spring um, with any of the pre-emergent herbicides except a later application. Um, so, in, especially in Western Nebraska, probably um, somewhere in late May um, and because it germinates so much later or early season, you can control it with pretty much any of the broadleaf triplet type products that have three herbicides in it and hit it hard then and should be able to take care of it. All right, your final one is, um, this is Omaha, what is this? It's been sprouting uh, for the last few years. Thought it was a weed. Yeah, this is actually a member, this is a, a hibiscus. Mm -hmm. um, it's an annual in this case and um, it's actually, it has a really cute name flower of an hour because it only has a flower for about an hour. It wilts and falls off after about an hour unless it's really protected. Um, and so that could also be controlled if they want to with pre-emergent and it is a prolific seed producer. So it will start invading any open spaces um, that you have. It's also known as Venice Mallow. Excellent, thank you, Rock. All right, you have um, some spruce. Okay. Several, the first is uh, east, um, near Bennett and just developed this year. It's near one that looks fine right next to it. What is it? Is it fatal? Um, well, the, I guess the first picture made me, where we had the, um, had the, the, the kind of red, ne red brown needles all over, mm -hmm. really makes me think that it, that it is environmental. Um, we were seeing a lot of injury that had occurred because, we, because of our hot, dry winds that, that came in June shortly after we had that cooler, wet May. Um, and so we, <coughs> excuse me, 
sore throat, sorry. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, but yeah, I this one this picture made me think that it was that it was more environmental, um, especially just the tips of it that are that are being affected. Um, but yeah, I think it's due to the hot, dry winds that we had. All right, the second one here is, uh, this is real Seward, so two pictures for this next one. Um, east side of the tree, she doesn't see anything like it on others, and I think she sent a close-up on this one, too. Yeah, and I think this is one of our needle cast diseases, um, either rhizosphera or, or stigmina. Um, go ahead and look, take a look at those reddish needles and see if you're seeing some black specks that are, um, that are forming on them. If you if you are, those are a sign of the a sign of the fungus. Um, nothing you can do about it right now, aside from maybe some pruning to increase airflow. But if you were concerned, you'd want to do um, a fungicide application next spring when those needles are about half expanded, and then a repeat application about six weeks later. All right. And your final one is this spruce appears to be dying. What can be done to save the tree? And this is probably the, the same thing, one of our, one of our needle cast diseases. Um, you know, some fu a fungicide ap application in the spring followed by, one, um, followed by one in the fall or about six weeks later may work. The other thing is I, on this one, I would look for any cankers, mm -hmm. especially as we have those entire branches that are, that are dying. Go, the way, go all the way back to the main trunk and see if you're seeing any of that white pitch. Cytospora canker is one that is, um, attacks spruces very commonly. All right, thank you, Kyle. Well, we are more than halfway through the backyard farmer season and it does seem like we just got started out there in our garden. Now is also the perfect time to get started on a fall crop. Here's Terry James to tell you what to plant. All season long we've been talking about how popular vegetable gardening has, ha has gotten because of the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Well, why stop there? Why stop in the summer when we can definitely expand your vegetable gardening well into the fall? So let's talk fall gardening. One of the great things about fall gardening is that those things that you started in the spring or you couldn't find in the spring, you can actually get started now. So a lot of the cool crops, broccoli, cabbage, spinach, radishes, all of those that we normally think of spring, we can actually get started now. And they really actually do much better now. They get established much more quickly because our soils are so much warmer. Most of those can all take a little bit of light frost and some of them can even take a light freeze. So we can definitely move them well into the, into the fall gardening season. The one thing that you really need to think about for fall gardening is the timing. So right now is about the right time to get most of those fall crops in. You can even get some of those, what we would consider warm season crops like green beans and maybe some zucchini in now also. But just remember if we get an early freeze, those would be done. What you need to do is look at the calendar and find when your last frost date is. Look at the back of the seed packet and, and figure out how many days you are to harvest, from seeding to harvest. You're gonna add 14 days to that just because of fall, because our weather is getting cooler and they're not gonna go quite as quickly when our days get a little bit cooler. And then you're gonna add 14 days for the frost date. So add about 28 days onto that and then you'll know when you can start. So a lot of those you know, you can start now, maybe even to the second week of August, depending on where you are located within the state. Another great thing about starting some of these, especially the warm season crops this time of year, is uh, we have lots of problems with squash bug and squash vine borer. Well, you're not going to have those problems with those. So if you wanted to get some extra squash in because that squash vine borer just demolished your plant, you'll be able to get those extra zucchini in. And another thing you can think about is um, protecting those plants. So if you do get them started and we do have an early freeze or frost, you can start them in a container. You can move those containers underneath you know, your awning or into the, into the garage or something to protect them for that evening. Or if you have them in a landscape bed or in one of your raised beds, you can get those floating row covers or some sheets or something to protect them for that night. 
So fall gardening is fantastic. Extend that vegetable garden well into the fall for you and keep getting that fresh produce for as long as you possibly can. <clears throat> this is really one of the ways to get the most out of your vegetable garden space. And as harvest time is near, you can start planting plants in the open spaces left after those spring plants start to fade. And mine, uh, the tomatoes are taking over all available inches, so I guess I'm out of luck on that. <laughs> all right, Jody, you have uh, the first one. This is, uh, we had two viewers actually send pictures of this. They think it's a cow killer. It is a cow killer. It's a, well, they call them cow, curl ant, cow killer ants. They have not killed any cows, but evidently if you get stung by this, it's a female wasp that has no wings. Um, that it can, it's enough pain to kill a cow, but it is not aggressive. Okay, so they're awful, but they are, they are. Uh, if you get stung, yeah, it's the same thing. Don't walk <laughs> around barefoot around the cow killer. All right, so your next one here is Omaha. Uh, he went, and he, he knows what the little, the uh, praying mantis egg case mm -hmm. is. It's the little guy next to it. Okay, this is a cuckoo wasp. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a parasitic wasp or kleptoparasite. So it goes into other wasps nests and lays its eggs close to their larvae. It's, it's beautiful and also kind of mean. <laughs> kind of like my son when he lived in the basement. Yeah, like it when he was just like, 26 years why old. Why collect yeah. any food for your, my larvae? I'll just lay my eggs by your larvae. What was the name of that? That's what I'm gonna start calling my son. Cuckoo wasp. Cuckoo, cuckoo wasp, yeah. there we cuckoo go. Cuckoo bird that just lays eggs in other Yeah, ones. exactly. Yeah. Oh. I love that. <laughs> we digress. Uh, we digress. <laughs> yes. Your next one, this is a Wayne uh, viewer. Um, found him on the ground, gave him a ride. What is it? Well, thank you, that's so kind of you. This is a newly eclosed or emerged uh, sphinx moth. Mm -hmm. And if an ash tree was close, it could be a great ash uh, sphinx moth. Mm -hmm. So it just needs to expand its wings and fly away. All right, your next one is David City, and she wondered what this long-legged beauty is. Okay, this is a katydid nymph. So the wings are not fully uh, formed, so it's not an adult, but yeah, those long, skinny back legs just show that it's um, in the grasshopper family, but that's a katydid. Awesome, and the final one here is near Wahoo, and what are these on the raspberry bushes? Yeah. We had two or three people yeah. send this. Yeah, we're seeing one. a lot of these now, too. These are called grapevine beetles. Um, there's another scarab beetle, like the green June beetle. Not really any need to control them. They're big, pick them off. All right, excellent. Okay, Rock, here we go with more of this. This is Omaha. What is this lighter green, more leafy grass growing out of the yard? And she sent this picture, and I think there is a second one. And Wow, another crabgrass plant. <laughs> yeah, it's crabgrass, and so you know you can control it now with once again quinclorac type products. Um, it's been mentioned on the show multiple times. All right, uh, this is a South Lincoln viewer. Uh, this is growing on the westish side of the house. She didn't plant it. Um, she wonders, is it a weed, or should she? What should she do here? I, I, I think this is a fescue that's flowering, you know, before setting seed. So it, it's got the um, pollen and all the other stuff going on. And, you know, she just happened to catch it in this picture, but there seems to be some mature ones back there. The seed head was a little bit different for tall fescue, but it's definitely one of the cool season grasses because this is when they um, flower. And I would say that would be an undesirable because, and I would take it down before it set seed because otherwise that seed's gonna be all over the garden. All right, excellent. And your, your uh, next one here, this is in Norfolk. This grass, in quotes, started to appear this spring. He's noticing more and more in the yard as the summer goes on. Yeah, I don't think this is crabgrass, but it's gotta be one of, it might be barnyard grass. Um, I would need to see a little bit more of the structure on it, but regardless, this can be controlled with pre-emergent in the spring. All right. Okay, Kyle, um, your first one here is a Beatrice viewer, has Concord grapes planted five or six years ago. This year they're opening up and turning brown. They're in the sun in the morning, in the afternoon, shade in the evening. They get watered about once every 10 days. Why are they turning brown? So a um, few things that can cause, cause grapes to crack. A lot of times it um, goes into moisture availability, but if that's not really um, an issue, Powdery mildew can also cause grapes to, grapes to crack like that. And initially the cracks will be um, fairly green and there won't be all this black stuff. But once we have cracked fruit, then there's all these other all these other fungi that want to take advantage of this free food source. 
So they'll come in and start colonizing that tissue and really um, add to some of that discoloration. So basically he would have to pluck these off? I, yeah, pluck those off. Um, you, I would not eat those grapes. Um, I don't think anybody would want to eat those grapes. But, but yes, yeah, so avoid eating them. Um, and as far as um, some sort of control, you know, chemical control on grapes um, can be difficult unless you really are um, following a prescribed sp spray schedule. All right, and your next one, uh, this is Hastings. What's wrong with the cucumbers? Uh, they're in a 36 inch patio pot on a trellis and they were, um, they were labeled bush. And then she also had a question about the pepper. So I think the, uh, I think the cucumbers, it's probably just some, some issues with, with pollination. Um, is what's occurring there, and so maybe a little bit, a little bit too hot um, there, and that's why we're getting the some of that that misshapen, misshapen fruit. Um, and then with the with the pepper, you know, I, I guess I was just seeing some kind of bl a black on the opposite side of the of the stem, so I'd call that the blossom end, and I'm wondering about blossom end rot that's occurring there on the pepper. Um, that is. One that we see, see very commonly, um, it is, it's actually a, it's a calcium deficiency at flowering, but most of our soils have more than enough calcium in there. And so really it ends up being an, a watering issue. So with blossom end rot, we always wanna make sure that we are doing that, um, really giving that, doing that consistent watering so the plant is getting the calcium that it needs to not, not have the rotted blossom ends. Excellent, thank you, Kyle. Well, we give you announcements of interesting things going on in the gardening world, and we have a handful of those tonight. The first is a seed alert, and that would be if you are receiving any unsolicited seeds in the mail from anywhere, do not open them. Contact USDA, uh, and that number is 402-434-2346. We're, we're getting a lot of reports about that mm -hmm. all of a sudden. Our second one is our Grow Big Red virtual learning series is still going on. Our next one is Preserving the Harvest. Register at go.unl.edu slash all that other good stuff every single Tuesday through September at seven o'clock. And we have all our good extension educators answering those questions. Our final one, of course, is Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays right after the show, so you get to do that as well and give us your comments. Follow us on Backyard Farmer and uh, NET to be able to do that. All right, we have a little bit of time left, so a question. Uh, Jody, do you want to fill in the blanks a little bit on the Zimmerman? Because you oh, yeah, because the... I uh, spaced out. I don't know <laughs> what day it is or month we're in. So <laughs> treatment for Zimmerman pine moth is August and then April. So it just coincides with different parts of their life cycle. I do not know what month we're in. Uh, tomorrow it will be still like July. July. Okay. August. <laughs> July. August. There we go. All right. So that, uh, so yes. that would be time so, for them to yes. <laughs> go ahead. So get ready. Get your stuff ready. <laughs> All right. So, Rock, your next one here is also a weed one. Uh, this is uh, people wondering, is it time to do Creeping Charlie and Violet Control? And if so, with what? Okay, so Creeping Charlie and uh, uh, Violet are both perennials. We want to control our broadleaf perennials in the fall, so they probably need to wait a, a couple more weeks till it cools off a little bit because we don't recommend herbicides when it's really scathing hot. And I would recommend a product with phylox, or excuse me, with, yeah, phylloxapyr or um, clopurulid in it. They work really well on that. And I, you know, they're usually labeled as uh, poison ivy killer or something like that, but um, you know, you want the really, the, some with some punch to it because those are difficult to control weeds. All right, uh, Kyle, you have about 20 seconds here. So this is a question about will uh, plastic solarization get rid of those soil borne diseases in a garden? Is that a good idea? Um, if you do it properly, it, it can get rid of a lot of them, but Big thing is that you're making sure that you have, have thick enough plastic um, and making sure that you're using the right color of plastic as well. Some people will want to uh, use black plastic. That doesn't work near as well as the white plastic or the clear plastic that actually allows the solar, f solar rays through. So clear plastic solarization should work. 